Dr. Gladys, thank you so much for um for saying yes to me. Well, I'm so glad because I'm so interested in people who are starting things because all my life I've been starting things and there have been people who have reached back to me and helped me forward. And so that's the way it's gone. If if I hadn't had the the outreach that came from the deeper inreach that I was doing, it never would have gone any place. So, you know, I, I'm right there with you. So tell me, um, in regards to, to your book and all the amazing stories that, that you, you share within the book, um, I want to... So I think that's what you're doing with what you're working with. You know, you take what you get and you move forward and then you can get what you would really like. But at the first, you take, you take what you can get. Yeah. And it's interesting that you mentioned the moving forward, which you mentioned in your book. And it's, um, it's something that, that we all contend with. And it's, it's, it can be quite challenging and difficult when, for example, in my case, and I'm sure many people have a vision, a dream, and then you have the self doubt and then you're, you know, you're not sure and you're fighting various waves or challenges. Um, it's the moving forward and actually physically and emotionally allowing that movement to flow. Yes, it's, it's having your direction clear enough in your own mind that you can't let it get stopped. It's like I was sent to the psychiatrist three times while I was in medical school because the teacher, the, the dean of the school, didn't think I understood what medicine was supposed to be about. And psychiatrists would do what he could do, and then he'd send me back. And so <laughs> it was a matter of my understanding what it was that I was working with and just hanging in there. And what, in your opinion, was your understanding of what medicine is and what medicine was? How you know, sort of what you thought and how it's evolved for you? Well, it wasn't just killing diseases. Mm. It, it wasn't that. That was part of it. It was being able to help people understand the disease process mm. and with it. It's like my oldest son, when he'd finished his training in orthopedics, came through Phoenix on his way down to Delhi, Rio to start his practice. And he said to me, Mom, I'm real scared. I'm going to pe have, have people's lives in my hands. I, he said, I don't think I can handle that. And I said, well, Carl, if you think you're the one that does the healing, you have a right to be scared. But if you can understand that it's your job to do what you've learned in a way with love that works, because I'm telling you, if I have something that's broken. I don't want a barber fixing it. I want an orthopedic surgeon because you've learned something, but it's the way you use it that's important. And that is by connecting with the physician within the patient that you're working with. You've got a colleague there who can take what it is that you're working with and make it possible for the patient that's doing it. <clears throat> It's very interesting because one of the things that I have found in clinic is that a lot of the, not a lot of the time, but quite a lot of the time, you have to remind the patient that they need to take charge of their own healing. That it's, it's that number one, I can't do it for them. And number two, the, the allopathic medicine might support and help, but it won't necessarily fix the situation fully and that they need to take charge of of their of their movement of their drive right right what you're doing is with love because love it in the essence is the great healer mm. no matter how <clears throat> no matter what the modality is the way in which it's presented to the patient and worked with with the patient it's like i have a a friend who's a psychiatrist and he's working with the, the medical school here and the other 
a couple of weeks ago, he had a, 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 a one of the students, one of the, the medical students that he was working with, who he was going to meet at the door of a hospital patient. And so she was waiting there for him. And when he got there, he said, well, let's go in. She had the chart and everything. She said, oh, we don't need to. And he said, what do you mean we don't need to? She says, he has Alzheimer's. What's he not going to, he's not going to understand anything. And he said, now just a minute. Let's really think about who's in that room. He said, the patients in that room with Alzheimer's. But in that room also is his wife who loves him and will understand everything that we say and with love will get, do what needs to be done with the patient. So it's not a matter of what we teach him, but the fact that we actually understand that there's something within that whole process that is love and healing and working, and we have to touch them. Mm. And so it was that bringing that whole thing together that uh, I thought was he did very well in presenting this medical student with what it was or where they really were needed to go. Do you find that in the medical world now, because there, there's so much strain, I mean, I'm not sure how it is in, in America, but here, absolutely, there's a lot of pressure on the NHS, um, that people have lost due to pressure, due to time, they've lost the ability to hold and listen to the patient and connect to the patient in that way, that it's just kind of another number unfortunately. Absolutely. We need to li listen to the position within that patient. Mm. It's my telling my son, you know, this is our, those of us who understand this, it's not a secret, who understand this basic understanding about what healing is all about. It's our job and our blessing to be able to teach it just like you're doing. Mm -hmm. Reaching out to, to physicians who have been um, schooled in the uh, war against disease and pain. They're trying to get rid of it and kill it. Well, what we're saying, not get rid of it, understand it what's it saying how can you work with it what's it how, how's it in your in the patient's body and mind and spirit how is this disease process working what's going on there it's a whole uh about six le levels up of understanding what's going on in the patient's life and and yeah, healing absolutely I've, i find that when we look at you know there's no one solution there's no one kind of pill or one remedy because everyone is so different and everyone's attitude or or way of thinking impacts their condition um but you might have five people with rheumatoid arthritis or five people with cancer and they will manage it completely differently, mentally and emotionally. And at different times in their lives, they'd, they'd handle it differently. Mm -hmm. you know, certain times in your life, the, you know, the way you can handle this process is something like, well, when I had, I had a bout with uh, cancer way back 30 years ago, and the way I handled it then was uh, totally, I went on a 30-day fast and I went, went through a, a whole process. I could no more do that now than, uh, than me fly. I mean, so when I had it six years ago, or well, however long that was, I had to take it into a completely different 
process because that was what was available to me. When we get out an edict and say, this is the way, and we expect people to find the way, <laughs> we're, we're kidding ourselves. Mm. If we put it out and say, well, here's a way in which you can do it, and we'll work with you in this way, and if the patient reaches back to us and we get the communication going in a loving way, boy, have we got healing going. Right on. Do you believe that if we tackle fear, for example, when people are sick, that one of the biggest things is, is fear because there is the fear of the unknown. Am I going to get better? All those kind of emotions come in. If sort of whether it's the practitioner, the physician, if they were to manage the fear factor, do you believe that the healing would improve faster? When fear steps in, love tends to step out. But if we can get the love going and work with the fear, I mean, it's just another symptom, really, fear is. But it's a, it's, it's a stopper if we, if we let it be. But if we can understand that it's, it's another symptom and that it's a very important one for us to pay attention to and not just tell a patient to get over it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, that's a stupid statement. You have to live through it. If you can live through it, you can understand that whatever that process is, you'll, you'll understand it. It's easy to uh, overlook the simple everyday stuff that we do. But that's what's important. Those are the, I find that those are the keys. When you, when you sit with the patient and you ask them the questions and you, you know, figure out, as you mentioned, you sit down, you figure out, okay, well, what are you doing? What are you not doing? How are you sitting? How are you driving? You know, sort of all those little nuances and then that gives you a bigger picture of what's happening to the entire system yeah 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 because you're living that life with that patient when you're tr see uh, tr one of the beautiful things uh, about being able to work with people is that we get to live part of their life stories with them and as we get to listen to those and listen to what they're telling us, we get to understand what's going on for real. But we have to listen, and we have to listen with love. And those two, listening with love just chases fear away. Do you believe that for a person that is suffering with whatever it may be, that if they if they research and look at the different options, because they might not have a, a practitioner or a doctor that takes the time, do you think that if they start researching and understanding their system, their body, that they could actually start to work, at, work it out themselves? Or do you think that they always need and rely on, on somebody else? No, absolutely. They can sometimes work it out. I love it when, when I was in active practice and the patient would come upon, come upon the thing that was causing the problem and call me and tell me. And so we'd rejoice together, you know, that we've been, look, been look, that that's what we were looking for. You know, this is a, a joint effort. I have ways of, of, reaching out to the patient for what we can do with it. But actually, there are things that, that they understand that they're doing and that may be the thing that's actually causing the problem. I mean, you've got... Listen, we have to listen with love and accept what they're saying. You know, not tell them that they're stupid. Yes, yes, absolutely. And 
and really kind of take on board where they're coming from because many times when we're listening, we might not actually understand where they're at. Understand at another level that is beyond everyone is different. The problem with medicine when we uh, have a cookie cutter answer to all of our, you know, this disease and this disease and that disease, uh, it's that, you know, it may stop that disease and kill that disease and so on. And it may not answer the patient's problem. On the other hand, if you really looked at it and listened to what the patient was saying, and then use that cookie cutter with an understanding of what you're doing and with a loving reach, the patient may find another way in which they can do it. People uh, who are stuck in dark places, it's sort of, if you're carrying a bag of pain over your shoulder and you're always looking back over your shoulder, you need to turn your face back the other way or you're going to get a stiff neck, you know, because it's, it, the pain is back there. But you need, we all need to move and not be stuck in, into where it is and start looking for the light and love. Over the shoulder is darkness and fear. Looking forward, looking towards the light, we find the light because the light is always there. The sun always comes up. The morning very sunshine, you know, it always comes up. We may not see it every day, but we know the sun's up there. We know the moon's up there. We know the stars are up there. Light is always there. Mm. And darkness is going to slip in any time it can. And it's how to manage the two. Yes. Yeah. 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 How important do you think it is to have faith? Oh, I think it's absolutely essential. Mm. You know, I think we have to have faith in something, whether it's a position within ourselves which it, or whatever, whatever you see, I ha, this isn't any kind of theology. This is just my idea that when God, whatever God is to any one of us, when God created the earth, it was perfect. Everything was just exactly the way it was supposed to be. It was perfect. And then God created the human being. And he called us and said to us, now, I've created this earth and everything is perfect. And now I've created you and you're the only be living beings on this earth who have free choice and free will. I therefore give you dominion over the earth and we in our arrogance, thought he said dominance. And we said, oh boy. And we pulled it all in and said, it's ours. It's not ours. It's ours to work with because we're given the choice of how we love it and help it grow and help like we were a baby, how we are actually going to work with Mother Earth and let her be who she needs to be. So what I'm finding, and I think you're probably finding this too, that I'm, the people that are reaching back to me for understanding or something, I think are reaching for their true humanity. Because I think in the process of thinking we're about dominance, we lost the challenge that we had of taking care of Mother Earth. And that's dominion because that's what we were given. And then we kind of messed it up. Yeah. It's, it, not really it, it's a beautiful thought. And it makes me think as well of, of the dominion of, our, of ourselves. 
you know, so we, we've given that to somebody else and we, because we've done that, we're losing the ability to understand who we are and how we function. Yes, because this body is our earth. So, yeah. And the body is perfect. It's got all kinds of nuts and corners and messes up and so on. But really, the, the, the essence of who we are, are, we're created in a perfect union. But, you know, because of stuff and things, it's not perfect. It, it, it has areas in which we need really the process of, of healing. And that's why you're in the kind of work you're in and why I was in the kind of work I'm in. Uh, do we ha do I have a time for a little story? Yes, of course you do. Okay. I had this uh, wonderful friend. He was a family friend for years. And then he moved into, all, into dementia. And we found him a place where he was well taken care of. And, and I knew that he was well cared for and so on. So this one day, I went over, one week, I went over to visit him. But I took a little plant. It was a little green plant in a little pot. And I took it to him. And I, when I went into the room, in his, into his room, I said, James, here's it. I brought you a gift and it's your, this plant loves you. And I brought it to you so that you could take your, I don't know. I said a bunch of things and I, I, I had no idea whether he was understanding what I was saying. Cause he just looking around, you know, and everything. So I put the plant on the windowsill and told him he should water it and so on. I don't know what all I said, but, you know, I'm just talking away. And then I left. And I came back a week later, and he met me at the door, and he says, magic, magic, you know. And I said, what, what, what? And he takes me in, and he says, box. And he walks over to the air conditioning box. And he says to me, but push this button, everything is cool. Love's cool. He says, push this button, everything is hot. Plant doesn't like hot. And I thought, oh my, isn't that amazing? He had a love affair going on with that plant. Mm. And they were supporting each other. The little plant is growing up there and, the, and, and he's aware of the whole process. It was, I was so excited and pleased that, about what he and that little plant were doing in this world. I mean, for me, it was like, yes. <laughs> Yeah, it's 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 the intention, isn't it? It's it's kind of having a focused intention. Yes, and and accepting the fact that it could happen. Yeah. You know that a plant could really love you back. Yeah. Well, that it would respond to what the air conditioner did. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Gladys, I one last. Um, question because I know that we're nearly at our end and and it's time I've taken enough of your time um I wanted to ask it's I don't know if it's too big of a question when it comes to the youth of today what tips or what would you suggest to them on how to manage what they're dealing with because they're dealing with quite a lot at the moment you know sort of emotionally uh, electronically, politically, you know, there's a lot that is overwhelming a lot of the youth of today. So what wise words would you, would you give them before you, before you go? Look for love and light and light and hope. Look for what you want to looking for, because honestly, if you just 
if the, the dark places are always showing up, they're, they're not the only places around. There is the light, and light always overcomes darkness, and love always overcomes fear. And, you know, there, there is a, this forward movement, but, the, but it's so easy to get stuck in the dark places and, and not turn ourselves around and pull ourselves out of it. But we have choice. We have choices. And if we choose to look for the light, we'll find it. If I'm walking down a path, a dark path with my flashlight, and it's a good flashlight, and I can see every step ahead. But if I look over to the one side or the other, there may be a little flickering light over there that doesn't doing. You know, it seems to not doing much. But if I take my flashlight, which is a good strong flashlight, and shine it over that. It'll shine that flashlight up. In other words, if we can actually take what we have, no matter what that is, how, what you call it, and share it with somebody else who, who's just starting to get something going and they need some help in taking the steps to do it, put your light where theirs is. And because it's not going to take anything away from you. I mean, this is just going to enhance what you're doing anyway. So just take it and use it and, and glory in it and, and dance with it and sing with it and, you know, use it. And a very fine your juice, as you say in your book. <laughs> <laughs> and even if you have to walk with a walker, you can still give it a name and and do the thing that you need to do. Yeah. Well, Dr. Gladys, you you are an absolute inspiration, really are. I saw you cycling with your tricycle uh, a few days ago. I was I was super impressed. And so keep moving and thank you so much for this opportunity to talk and and to ask you questions and and to share your knowledge with, with as many people as, as we can. I really, really appreciate your time. Well, it gives it life. And I thank you. <laughs>